I will be doing a series of interviews and conversations with some very, very interesting people. Uh, being honest with you, I'm, I'm getting some withdrawal symptoms over having no festivals, having no events. And I decided to set up a platform online where I would engage some really interesting writers and sit them down for a conversation through internet channels. Uh, what I really want to say in the outset is uh, please get involved. This is about you. It's not about me, it's about you and the, the writer I'll be interviewing. Uh, so please, if you, if you, I'll tell you in advance who I'm going to be interviewing. If you, if you like the topic, please give questions. I will pose them to the person. If you like the conversation, like the conversation I'm going to have this afternoon, if it stimulates your mind, stimulates your imagination, uh, please throw your comments, your observations, your feedback, everything is welcome. And uh, we can make it as engaging and as interactive as possible. Tonight's topic, we're going to be talking about, well, I'm going to be talking with a very distinguished epidemiologist and poet. We're going to be talking about her work. We're going to be talking about COVID-19. And particularly, we're going to be talking about the kind of questions COVID-19 poses to us as a society. Will this pandemic make us a better society or will it make us worse? So the big question, so pl please get involved. So without further ado, I wanna really introduce um, my very distinguished guest this afternoon. Professor Mona leiden Rachel is uh, a very, very a distinguished epidemiologist of some standing. Her doctorate in epidemiology and high risk obstetrics is from the University of Washington. She has had a series of very, very distinguished academic posts, including people, uh, professor of epidemiology and high risk obstetrics, excuse me if I'm mispronouncing that, uh, high risk obstetrics in University College Cork. So any uh, Corkonians out there, any uh, UCC alumni, I will be talking this afternoon to your professor and I bet you you're really jealous. Uh, in addition to academic posts, she's also worked as an epidemiologist in the field. She has worked in countries as diverse as Georgia, Liberia, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and we will be talking about that. She is also, of course, and which has really attracted me to her work initially, is as well as being an epidemiologist, she's also a poet. Uh, her most recent collection, and I have it here, on the Brink of the Sea. It was published by Cave Moon Press last year. Uh, I have been reading it and I can, I can vouch it is very, very accomplished. We will be talking about it in some depth. And as well, let me, let me just say as well that all proceeds of this book, all proceeds of the sales goes to Catholic Relief Service. Um, so um, without further ado, hello, Professor Rochelle, how are you? Very well. Thank you for all the, all the way, <laughs> all the way from New Mexico, uh, the land of enchantment. Yeah, no, definitely. Now, I've never been. As I told you before, I want I want to go. Uh, I'm sorry as well about the hair. Uh, I haven't had a haircut. We, we have hairdressers have been out actually <laughs> months here. <laughs> but um, so yeah, I, as I was saying, I received your collection. Um, and, I, and I've been reading it. And one of the things that really uh, struck me is you do reference on several occasions in poems like Atonement, which is really quite something, uh, your experiences working as an epidemiologist in Africa. Uh, and, you know, it's, I guess at the moment, the, the, the Europe and the Americas are very much what they call the epicenter of the virus. So all the spotlight is on them and uh, we are struggling through the pandemic. But many people, um, Professor, um, feel that Africa could be particularly vulnerable, that the tsunami of COVID-19 hasn't hit Africa yet and uh, many are worried for the continent. I suppose in light of that, uh, could you, for the benefit of people who wouldn't be familiar with your work, could you describe the kind of work you did in Africa as an epidemiologist? I can, and by the way, um, in case we forget, I just checked the statistics today and Africa, uh, every single state now has COVID cases and the numbers are climbing rapidly. Yeah, 
um, from reliable sources. And it, there were really two, I did not go to the DRC, that, and we might get into that with the poem Ariana. Um, in 2006, uh, oh, I beg, beg your pardon. That's my fault. No, I should. No, everyone thinks that because. Oh, really? Kind of, yeah, it's like. Okay. Wow. <laughs> that makes me feel so much better now. <laughs> yeah, it does. Like I'm. Yeah. Um, anyway, I, I went to Liberia. I was at the University of Washington, and it was at the height of the HIV pandemic. Yes. And a Franciscan a friend of mine. We we trained together in midwifery, and then we were friends and. She'd been in Liberia already, like, I don't know, close to 30 years through three civil wars. And she asked if I would come out and help assist in the programmatic issues of maternal to child transmission of HIV. They, they, they were no drugs, very little testing, and it was, it was pretty bad. And so I went over there and I had not been to Africa. It was quite amazing. Um, it was immediately post-Civil War. And when I landed, there were tanks everywhere, bombed out buildings. Their slum there at the time was considered the worst slum in the world. Mm. Anyway, so I was there for about eight weeks and just was helping her uh, train and kind of assess their programs. Like the Catholic Church in, in that area was incredibly active on all levels, including uh, particularly maternity care. And then I was just so taken by that, that the next year I was approached by the global program at the University of Washington, even though I was doing domestic research on cesarean section. And they asked if I would take over a failing project in Mombasa, Kenya. Okay. So that was a, a NIH funded study that was assessing, you ready, HIV positive, sex workers okay, in uh, Mombasa's at that time in 2007. Go ahead. Oh, Again, no, no, it's just it's, uh, it, the, the concept of a HIV positive sex worker um, just puts, knocks you off the chair. Like it's, it, it strikes me as, um, were, were, the, were the sex workers conscious of being HIV positive? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it was predominantly Muslim. I ended up working seven days a week. It, the the pro, program, and it was, a, it was a tough study. I had questions about some of the ethical things once I, once I got there. Um, anyway, um, it was pretty poor at that time in Monrovia. There were a few things that really threw me. One was, I didn't see any Irish, but there was huge uh, tourist sex visitors from Europe. And it was, they would come to Mombasa for paid sex. I, it, I had just, a, a lot of things threw me for a loop when I was there, including, we have to have a little bit of humor, since you have an Irish audience, if you don't mind. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. They, they handed me a key. I didn't really get an orientation. They handed me a key. Like, most people don't drive in Africa, particularly Kenya. And okay. the Belgium who handed me the keys, he said, look, this is the thing. If someone looks like they're coming towards you, act like you're going to crash into them. Because it was a bomb. I was driving a real beat up wreck. And so that's what I did. I was like, Wait. and my nickname in my teens and 20s had been Crash Leiden because I was always getting in accidents. I didn't okay. get it. Well, I didn't get it. I did not get in an accident, but the, the last thing about this Kenya thing was uh, I did get carjacked at a gas station. Guy had a gun and he got <laughs> and I just kind of went, acted crazy, drove crazy. And at one stoplight, he jumped out and let me go. So, uh, so uh, and was it frightening for you, Mona, that kind of experience? Uh, <laughs> Like it's not everyone can say uh, you said it so casually there that you were you were you were you were carjacked in Kenya. It's not it's not an experience. Every, anyone not everyone lives through that. <laughs> I don't know. I have a I have a warped sense of humor. So I, I think I, I think fine. yeah. Well, I think you you've actually answered the second question because my second question from reading your collection, what really um, what really fascinated me was like poems like Atonement, Laments, Liberia. There. 
they're almost like a narration of an experience in in Liberia. And they're full of very vivid details. Like obviously, I found them almost novelistic in some respect. You really captured the scene. There was almost the smells, the feel of the place. It was also, being honest with you, there were some very uncomfortable details. <laughs> like uh, <laughs> and I think I think there I was more, exactly what there was more than a hint of almost cathartic humor there as well. Um like when you described the, the rape, uh the treatment of women in Liberia and the kind of suffering they had went through. Where uh, you know, the, the child soldiers in the streets and um but I suppose uh, I think you have answered the second question because what always intrigued me from reading it was were these experiences based on, on real life for your poetry? Or did you uh, imaginatively recreate your experiences? Was there an element of, re of imagination, of fiction, of, uh, of novelizing in your poems? I think particularly the poems that are talking about things in Africa or when, uh, when I volunteered for Doctors Without Borders and when I was in Abkhazia. Yeah. There were things you would see that never made the news, people don't know about, uh, and they just, they get in you. And in fact, I still volunteer and as peer support when people come back from mission from Doctors Without Borders, because it's a volunteer thing and I'll talk to them peer to peer because when people come back from those kind of experiences, people don't want to hear about it. And yet it's that history, particularly in a lot of Catholic poetry of witness. It's a little bit overused, that, but the, the prophet, the seer, the, and there's a long history of that. We, you know, the Spanish poets were talking about, you know, the bubonic plague and it, it, it goes on and on. But I, I do try to do it in a way, I know some of it's visceral, but some of it I try to do um, more poetic with, with your assonance, your imagery, your smell, your taste. Um, but a bit of that prophetic thing, not because those those people aren't heard generally, and people it doesn't make the news. People aren't interested in this crazy stuff that people can go through that live in dire poverty or war, that kind of thing. I yeah, no, I, that thought crossed my mind when reading the collection. I must I must admit, there was almost <laughs> a feeling. Yeah, there was a feeling that we don't talk. We we're almost insulated from this world. And I felt it, it was very powerful the way at the end of atonement, you were, you, the, the narrator was in the convent and uh, the child, you know, the, the woman had to give birth to the child, Ariana, I think. And then in the next poem, uh, you know, you know, the poem really is about the death of Ariana from Ebola. And I think, um, I think you almost concede in the poem that it, it, the, that is something so profound that you, you can't really be represented in verse. But I suppose a question that did strike me was um, writing poetry about experiences like this. And you don't have to dwell on the, the experience with the, with the death of the child if you're uncomfortable in any way, Mona. Mm -hmm. But do you think writing poetry about experiences of this kind, they're in, in any ways, like I know the word therapeutic is misused, it's commodified a bit, but do you think they are cathartic or in any way uh, they help you channel these emotions by writing about them? There, is, there any, is, there any, is there any truthfulness in that? Uh, actually, I got to be friends with Ian Duggan. He's a Franciscan poet in Cork. Yeah. And he really oh. does not like confessional poetry. Really, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and, and I he's thought Franciscan. About Franciscan, he's lovely. Oh. I, I think he's still with us. He's, he's elderly now. Um, I don't think it's so much cathartic. It's more like the muse, the storytelling. Mm. Uh, it's two things. One is in, in the end of uh, Atonement, when this birth happens, Ariana, I was writing about that basically almost 10 years after it had happened. And so it had built up over the years, over the years, that kind of thing. But two things about the ending with a, a lovely birth, it was a beautiful birth. I didn't see it, I made it up. Um, I did head practice as a, as a midwife did, for yeah. almost 20 years. And you know, drew on that experience, the joy of it. And the other thing was, um, I'm an American. So I kind of had to have a happy ending. I mean, it was, <laughs> it, 
it's kind of a dark poem. Yeah, you know, with TV series and everything. It was almost always a happy ending. So that, and then the irony is uh, because people aren't familiar with it. So fast forward to 2015. You know, I was in love here in uh, 2006. By 2015, I I left UCC. I was back in America, and was writing poetry and was able to take a course at Seattle University, a lovely Jesuit school and lyric poetry. And this professor, she was a Washington State Poet Laureate and she was teaching us the persona. At the same time, I was reading uh, about the Ebola crisis in Liberia. It was the second worst at the time. And my friend was there still. And so I thought, oh, I'm gonna write a persona you know, and she taught us how to do that. You know, you're putting yourself in someone else's shoes, you're drawing on something. And it was like the muse. I don't know how to explain it. It's like the muse. And so I wrote that. And almost every poem I wrote under her tutorage got published in really good journals. They published it in JAMA. It's a short poem. It's lyrical. And it has all these layers too. Like I signed it, Charles de Foucault. He's the um, French priest that was martyred in North Africa. Way oh, back. that's interesting. Because initially when I read that, I thought it was the doctor. Well, everyone did. And you know, really? Is, okay, so I have crew. <laughs> well, I feel a little better than <laughs> I, ha I have to go, oh, hallelujah. I did, it. I did the persona right. I got so many letters from physicians thanking them, thanking me for what I had done. It was so admirable. And I hadn't. I just kind of imagine, because Doctors Without Borders, MSF, Medicine Soul Frontier, they were there at the time. I knew the scene from way back when, so it was, so does that? No, that's, that's very interesting, and uh, I understand 100% uh, where you're coming from. Another thing that really uh, fascinated me about your collection, Mona, was the religious themes and motifs that run through a lot of the poems. Like I felt that there was a there was a tremendous range how you dealt with religion. There was almost in poems like um, Lament for Liberia, there was almost ironic reference to religion. Uh, there was an element of humor. But then in the in the in the title poem of your collection, On the Brink of the Sea, which I think is um is a is a masterful poem, I felt you, you create almost this spiritual landscape. Uh, and this beautiful transcendent imagery. And I really feel it is transporting. I think reading it, you're almost elevated. And I suppose one question that did, that did strike me from reading it, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, if, if your readership is, um, is in North America and Europe, Europe particularly, you're dealing with a very secular society. And a, a number of your readers may not be as religious as they, as they once were. So I guess my question would be, would you as a poet who writes about religion, and let me just say as well, I feel that there's a positive, a religion is a positive force in your work, a lot of the time. And would you like readers like me to, for the poetry, maybe to inspire them to look at religion more positively, to maybe consider religion as a good thing, as a source of wisdom, as a source of consolation, as a source of spiritual truth. Is there, do you, have you, has that crossed your mind? Is that in your thought pattern at all? Truthfully, it is not. Okay. <laughs> Truthfully, I have been, um, one of the poems near the end of the book is uh, The Andalusian Way. Okay, yeah, yeah. My Friend the Jesuit. And there's several layers of the answer I have for you. Number one, um, I almost can never get published in any kind of Christian journal. Really? Can't. You, you, you can't get published in any Christian journal? Reject, reject, you know. That's right. just, that's remarkable. You know, it's just whatever. And it's, that's okay. I would rather, rather actually, you know, I've gotten um, published in some really excellent, poetry journals, secular, and I'm like, great. And in fact, um, Barefoot Abandoned is a villanelle in there that talks about the Rose of Tralee. And I got lots wow. of emails on that one be from people that just said, oh, I, it made, made me remember my first love, this kind of thing. You know? 
Um, so I, I definitely, I mean, I love the concept of evangelization. Um, I don't do it myself and it's writing from my own personal journey, uh, my own, my own Catholic personal journey. And that's a, another question. If you know, you let me know if you want me to go down that road, uh, cause it's been kind of interesting, but yeah. Yeah, no, uh, it's, 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 it's somewhat like my next question because, um, moving on a little bit, like I am fascinated by your, your background. Like you, when we first uh, met, you, you made it clear you were Boston Irish, you were a Boston Celtic. Um, um, do you think that maybe combining both, maybe combining both, could you go into a little bit about where are you from, you know, Massachusetts, Irish Catholic, could you describe that and, and describe your upbringing? <laughs> uh, um, okay. I, I had gotten some of these questions ahead of time. And because I'm a storyteller, I have a really hard time giving a short answer. No, I, no listen, listen. I, uh, be as long as you want, because it's interesting. It's interesting to well, me. Well, <laughs> I, I, was, I grew up in a town called Situate, Massachusetts. And it was called the Irish Riviera Whoa, okay. with, with great sarcasm from the Bostonians. Oh, really? Well, see, this is not a subtle distinction I'm not getting now. You're not from Boston, strictly speaking. You're correct. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, situate, the Irish now, I think Riviera. you forgive me for Democratic Republic of the Congo, but I'm not sure you're going to forgive me for this. That's, uh, oh, that's no, a big no. mistake. <laughs> my, father, my father's family was all from Boston. Okay, my, aunts, really, yeah. my aunts were from Boston. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, so, but we still, even though we're from Situ, we refer to ourselves as Boston Irish Catholic, and the town was a no-collar town. It was a, a lobster fishing town. So when I say no-collar, I mean, the, the only, uh, you know, educated, really educated people were the people that came down, the Blue Bloods from Boston, because they had all the estates on the, the coast. So that was that, and um, it was, it was a really mixed thing. It was an amazing blessing in terms of, as a child, having that freedom to be in a wild coast that there was no direct highway to. It was always flooding and storms. I rode my bike or walked across the marsh to the beach. All those things were good. I, I did lose my father, who was a poet, um, when I was one years old. And my mom was Sorry like, to hear that. yeah, and he was young. There's a long line of everyone dying on that side of the family. So, um, but my mom's side of the family, everyone was there, it was a large family. She'd grow, grown up in, literally in a shanty. Her father was an Irish Carradine Mosser. You know, I have pictures of him in his dory. And um, so that was, you know, it was, that's just kind of how it was. It was, they were always dropping off food because we were pretty broke and that kind of thing. But, that's enough of that. Um, the Catholic thing, that actually kind of put a smile on my face, that question, because we were talking about the influence on the poetry. And I started flashing back. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, I, I, I couldn't, ha I went for a little walk this morning to calm myself before the interview. My mother's passed in 2009. And by the way, she died on Good Friday at three o'clock. And I was with her. How Irish is that? I'm like, Mom, who dies on Good Friday at three o'clock? My mother, she had a very hard life. <laughs> anyway, um, so anyway, she was something. And I always thought that I was always angry with her, but she had a tough time. And when I was little, I was like quite the liar. There were no uh, Catholic schools. And so here we were, and I, we, she'd make us go up to the local St. Mary's, Confession on Friday, that was when there was a big queue. And I just go into confession, I just make up these crazy sins. I was like five and six years old. And the same with my aunts. I had two aunts that were sisters of St. Joseph's. And they, they had that Boston accent. And they, did you say you decked, Mona? Did you say you decked? Oh, yes. I didn't even answer when I was reading. You know, and so that continued, that continued through my whole childhood. And then um, we had to go to mass, the last thing. Um, mom didn't go to mass. So no. my brother and I would walk up, I don't know, it was about six miles up to the church through the marsh by the beach. And we, we were sneaky. We would go in, one of us would go in. Oh, and, and I had white gloves and I'd have a quarter and 
he usually would send me in to get the bulletin, see what priest was saying mass. Then we'd go buy donuts with the quarter, you know, and go home and lie to him and say, oh, yeah, Father Solomon was saying mass. You know, here's the bulletin. And, so, and that continued on how it was. And then I think when I was 16, walking out of mass, I used the F word and told my parents. My, by then it was my stepfather. You'll never F and catch me dead in a church again. And it, was, <laughs> it was 10 years. Gosh, gosh. And it was Sister Barb who I met, who we trained as a midwife, and the rest was history. I started moving back to the Catholic Church. And in these last 15 years, UCC, Ireland was great. I was there two years. Um, but um, I have had a spiritual, he, he won't let me call him a spiritual director, a spiritual companion, a Jesuit, who I adore, love. And uh, he's really brought me to places spiritually that I didn't know, including doing the 30-day uh, solitude retreat, the Ignatian retreat, where you don't talk, and you don't socialize, you see them once a day. That's kind of when I realized I had, lying was a sin. I didn't, <laughs> it was a survival mechanism. So anyway, so now, yeah, um, I actually really appreciate being Catholic. It's very important in my life. I'm loving the self-isolation. I think most writers are fine with it. And it's kind of monastic and time to it's write. Almost, it's almost normal. For yeah. Them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's the new normal for everybody else, but it's normal for artistic souls. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, look, I, I find I'm biased in the respect that I, I find the whole Irish American experience fascinating. And I think uh, listening to your stories from growing up in Massachusetts is, is very interesting. And um, I like the way as well. Um, you channel those experiences into your poetry. I think there's a lovely, um, like you mentioned humor earlier. I found the poems, particularly in the earlier parts of your collection, on your mother, on your mother's family, uh, they had a humor. Um, they had like a, a, a wry humor. And I just, uh, I, I, don't, I think that's very refreshing to find in poetry. Um, it, was, it was a nice blend of humor and seriousness. But I suppose another thing that, that interests me, uh, Mona, is, you know, you, you grew up in a very Irish Catholic community in Massachusetts. Uh, it was almost, I, I think we, it was almost, the word diaspora, which is probably overused, is almost applicable in your case. Um, and then you, you, you went to Ireland and you worked in Ireland, you worked in the UCC, during what we call in Ireland, at least, the Celtic Tiger. Yeah. which was a period of, because of the low tax enterprise economy, it produced a lot of wealth. And, um, you know, the perception at the time and the perception in retrospect was Ireland had changed a lot over that period. And I suppose one question that really fascinates me is from someone like yourself who grew up in a very Irish American community in Massachusetts, then went to Ireland in that period, did the Ireland you worked in, did it surprise you uh, in any way? Was it what you expected? Uh, was, did the country live up to your expectations? Or did it, did it um, was it less than what you expected in any way? Hmm. That's a tough one. Um, before I answer that, you know, I can never answer, give you a straight answer. Yeah, yeah. The, the other I thing understand. about, my husband can't stand it because epidemiologists are trained to look at what's wrong in the situation. So, you know, I, I tend to be a little negative. Um, I had oh, actually, no, please you know, be negative. Like, I, I think it's very <laughs> much, I want this conversation to be about critical thinking as well, getting the mind going. So please, negative yeah. is good because criticism, if, if taken on board, can help people to change and get better. Um, like, you've been very critical of your own country now, uh, Mona, in, in previous conversations. So don't worry about that. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, so, uh, you know, please, you can be, and anyway, you're part of the Irish family. So uh, don't, don't be shy about <laughs> the extended. Well, I have to say, yeah. I, I was going to print off the pie, but yeah. my D DNA is 96% Irish. Oh, Most well, Irish there you go. I mean, uh, that's you're pretty... probably all more Irish than me. Yeah, 3% French. You're a lot more. Yeah, well, that's what, it, what French French, okay, and yeah, yeah. One move over Elizabeth Warren, if you follow American politics, yeah, yeah. one percent Northern Native American. Um, and I'd actually traveled to Ireland in the 70s, I went for two months, uh, 
it was 73, I think, maybe 74. And our plan, my friend and I married Carrie. We were going to do Ireland, Scotland, England. We, we thumbed. We had so much fun. We never left Ireland. I mean, it was just grand. And I had, I had cousins there and we got to connect with them down in Cork and blah, blah, blah. And I'd went in the 80s and I went in the 90s because in the 90s I was traveling back and forth to WHO as a consultant and my daughter was at the University of Galway so I'd stop and would hang. Oh, she'd get so furious with me because my driving is so bad. And so I'd drive there too. And she'd be yelling at me, mom, mom, watch out. So anyway, and so I kind of, I was excited to go. The reason I actually, I was recruited uh, because they had not started a perineal epi center, epidemiology center. And um, so when I went, on one hand, Cork is Cork, you know? It's like, it didn't seem like it had changed a huge amount. But I did have to travel around. I didn't have a car. I did not get a car this time. Two years. I had a bicycle. And because it was a national center, I'd be, i take the train and the bus around Dublin and out to Galway and stuff. But one thing that I just thought was amazing and still, and it was actually my original experience, was how hospitable and generous people were and family-centered. And that, hit, to me, hadn't changed. What I wasn't prepared for was the urban sprawl. I just thought it was kind of hideous, and the development. And I think a lot of that was really exploding then. Mm. So that, uh, that was it. There wasn't anything uh, real, real negative other than I thought, don't become Americans. I was like, don't, you know, seeing these, like I said, the malls and the kind of you felt that, uh, yeah, you're definitely right in, in a lot of the cities, they, um, there's a legacy of bad planning that, um, and it's really quite atrocious. But one thing I think you hinted at there was, and which interests me, Mona, was that perhaps in Dublin and perhaps in Cork as well, you felt there was a, what you call a suburbanization of society. That namely that, you know, I, I jumped to the, the urban sprawl there was a tendency for people to not only live in in suburbs, which were neither towns nor villages, but almost semi-detached from the city, and maybe embrace the lifestyle and the values you associate with with suburbs. What, what, did you did you notice that? Yeah, I did. I all my relatives and my close friends didn't live in any of those areas, yeah. but I would see it in traveling, okay. and I just. And I, I was just taken away because it was just, forgive me, forgive me, ugly. It was like, and it didn't have that sense of community that I really enjoyed. Like Doolin, I mean, I, Doolin hadn't changed. Certain places just hadn't changed. Um, but. Yeah. And you, you think it's a way for, like, I suppose what people will say against that is Dublin is the engine of the country. It creates the jobs. It creates the employment. It creates the wealth. Uh, it can't replicate the kind of, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it can't replicate the kind of community you have in Doolin but do you think there's a way of having a big city in the modern world that is you know uh productive and fast-paced and everything else but also having uh residential areas that have a sense of community and they're not oh. these 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 suburban uh sub mass suburbanized living I'm, I'm smiling because I didn't see this question coming. So <laughs> what, what popped into my head, and I'm an introvert, so next week I'll think of the best answer. But actually, Seattle, we lived up in Bainbridge Island, which is a ferry ride west of Seattle for close to 25 years. It was, it was great. Um, Seattle's kind of doing it. And okay, think, really, yeah, yeah. They're kind of doing it right. And it, it wasn't like that when we moved there. But Amazon's there, Microsoft, Google, and some of the, it's kind of, it's kind of still okay. There's the issues of getting priced out. You know, there's, there's concerns about that for certain neighborhoods, yuppified, gentrified, but um, yeah. But I, I don't really know. I, I, don't, I haven't paid too much attention to that because actually I don't like cities. 
Yeah, sure. Yeah, you yeah. know, the, our little coastal town was like a village. It was called a town, not a city. And everybody yeah. knew everybody. But for okay. better, for, for worse. <laughs> well, like I say, there's wry humor in those poems. So I can just imagine it was a place full of character and color. Your, yes. your hometown. <laughs> that definitely <laughs> comes across in your work. Um, but as fascinating as that, as that topic is, um, I guess there, well, another big topic I really have to ask you. You are an epidemiologist, you are a poet, and uh, really I suppose the world at the moment, Mona, is consumed by coronavirus in more ways than one. And everyone is asking questions. And I guess my question is, do you feel, uh, well, the fir first question I'd love to ask you is, do you feel the corona, or do you think the coronavirus pandemic, it'll obviously cause damage. It'll, 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 in tragic circumstances, people will die, people will get sick. It'll also cause societal and economic damage. But my question for you, do you think, uh, what's your best bet at the moment? What's your best guess? Do you think coronavirus will change society permanently? Or do you think uh, it'll be bad for a while, but there won't be any permanent change? That after a year or six months, we'll get back to normal and we'll, it's a bad experience, but we'll kind of forget it ever happened. Which do you think? I see, there you go. It's an epidemiologist. It's, yeah. like, <laughs> it's like both. We look for something called effect modification. This is what I think, and I'm not a historian. I wish I was. Mm. Um, I do think it will be changed permanently. Okay, that's interesting. Right. I'm not going to say I don't know. Historian, I don't have an MBA. So I know it from the health perspective, but this whole issue of the chain and the interconnectedness of all the countries um, and it's not just the U.S. being dependent on China and all that stuff. It's kind of like a wake-up call for every place. Like, oh, we don't really have what we need. And then the whole footprint. I'm very much into the whole footprint and, and uh, climate change. And so this whole idea, I think countries, and actually Ireland is looking pretty good with COVID right now, but not... I don't, not, I know, I'll send you a link to the map. You might want to post it. It's really good. And, and actually, Please um, do. it's a consortium and it's a visual map and it's by the day and it's accurate. So and you're, you know, people, you can post it and, and see if people like it. But um, I don't know how, but I did look a little bit. The reason I kept saying I wish I was a historian, uh, I actually went back and looked at the Black Plague, which was the most fatal pandemic in human history mm -hmm. and the numbers between 75 and 200 million that was back then 75 to 200 million people in eurasia and north north america um died yes and it permanently changed society that's what it you know it was like change it in every way religion business and everything else oh and oh by the way I'm not into conspiracy theories, but they're pretty sure it originated in Asia. I went, oh my. Uh, so they, they, to, they, my actually, they actually, the, the, many historians believe that it originated in China. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is very unfortunate I mean, it, it for it Chinese viewers and listeners, but. Um, uh, but, but uh, that was, I, I just was looking at numbers. I don't know how, I'm not gonna predict how, um, I hope for the better, I hope for the better for, this is actually a blend of another question we had talked about, but a wake up call, particularly for uh, people who are really well off in whatever country. Frankly, I'm so biased. The Irish haven't conquered, the Irish tend to be generous. And in fact, when I went on mission for Doctors Without Borders, they asked me to get Irish citizenship because no one that kind, no one kind of hates the Irish, and they could place me. Versus, I was much more difficult to place. So I had two passports. I had my Irish citizen passport. That look back then, you could look at the line, the queue, and go, "Oh, that one's shorter." I'm Irish today. This, <laughs> you know, whatever. But um, all joking aside, it's so serious, and you know, we don't know what's going to happen now with 
Africa. I, every, not everyone. I wish people were, would wake up. Right now, they're just watching the local news. And again, when I was in Ireland, living in Ireland, I was really impressed with how much more informed the Irish were and better educated in terms of international politics versus just, you know, you're, I can say it, I'm American. The average American is kind of looking at their local news and wondering about, can they go get a hamburger? I mean, really, come on. Yeah, yeah. Although, and I'm not saying this out of politeness or anything, and, um, but as, as from the other side of the Atlantic looking in, I love the American confidence, self-belief and optimism. Um, and I think we could really do with a bit of that. And I think America gets a lot of bad press in the well, European right left-wing yeah. press. And I just, uh, I, I, for one anyway, I, I love that American spirit, that, um, that frontier spirit that you can, you, that you, you can, you can, you can, you can, you can, you can conquer the world's problems that, uh, and there's a great confidence in the American character. And I think that is very admirable. Um, but I do, uh, I do heed what you're saying, and I think it's very fascinating. And I think you were, you were, I think what you were saying there was the the, inf the interconnected supply chains across the country, the way, and and the globalized economy is very much along those lines. You know, um, you know, the raw material might be sourced in Asia, uh, the manufacturing happens in Asia, but the the, the consumption happens somewhere else. The, the the branding and, and everything else behind the product happens somewhere else and they're, they're all interconnected and that is um that's very worrying and that is that is a negative and i think there's many negatives but it also i noticed that you you felt there could be some positives um like i i guess you mentioned people being more generous do you think um do you think there's a case if you could get Pacific do you think there's any one industry or one country or, or an example of, of an industry or a country or a form of behavior that pre-COVID was selfish that could now become post-COVID a little bit more generous? Like it could be taxes, it could be profits, it could be anything. You know, I apologize. <clears throat> that one I can't really give you a clear answer because I haven't reflected on that really well. Um, yeah, I apologize, but no, I know I understand. It's just difficult to know because I think there is an awful lot. Um, I notice there is an awful lot of there is hope, and people have expressed a hope that COVID nineteen will lead to people rethinking society, and there's a great need for a better society. I think. I think there's a lot of dissatisfaction with the way things are run. I noticed here in Ireland, we had a very divisive election there uh, in February, I think. And there was a real great, there was quite clearly a dissatisfaction with the status quo. But I fear, Mona, I fear it is, it is vague. I think there's a lot of emotion there. There's a lot of hope. But I, I'm just, I guess I'm a bit like yourself. Like you're trained as an epidemiologist. You're trained in specifics and detail. And I suppose you want the details. How how specifically things will change for the better? I'll tell you something. Uh, yeah. It's not necessarily for the better, but I think it is for the better. I, I do. Uh, I'm retired for, yeah. from ep epidemiology, but I still follow things like New England Journal of Medicine yeah. and you know, equivalent of your Lancet. Yeah. And that gives me hope. I, be, yeah. I they have a free podcast once or twice a week by the editors. They've been trying to fast track clinical trials. And I think what, in a good way, what's happened is kind of the epidemiology's done a pretty good job up till now. And now what's really critical are the vaccine and the treatment, medication, randomized controlled trials. You really need those. Epidemiology doesn't do that. They, they look at, they follow data. They look at outbreaks, um, that kind of thing. Um, and it can be quite important, quite high quality. But for example, you know, right now no one's doing, there's not a great way to measure the effect of social distancing. And the reason is the epidemiology data is only, uh, sorry, studies are only as good as the data you get. And so we know a lot of the testing, uh, there's false negatives, there's not been enough testing. It's varied in countries. Some of the countries have done a great job with the testing. The US, uh, 
really had the biggest problem with failed testing, poor testing, inaccessible testing, and, and that's been at the root of a lot of our problems. But, um, I just, I have gotten a sense, not just in the States, but in other countries, that there's a deep appreciation and gratitude. I'll start to cry. I'm a, I'm a poet, you know. Like, no, you're Dutch alone. You know, no, Dutch alone. You know for, for the physicians, the nurses, the midwives, the first responders, people hanging in with the grocery store, uh, getting people being rude. <laughs> um, and the research scientists, it's, it's been amazing. Teachers doing the best they can with, you know, in, in developed countries where you have technology and you can zoom, but uh, I don't know, you know, it's, and it's going to be a while. We don't know how it's going to unfold. There's a lot of, there are a lot of epidemiological models based on data that are predicting it's, it's going to be people can get reinfected. There's all this new, every day is more information. And I've noticed this new backlash against science. Mm. I don't know if it's happening there. It's happening backlash here. against it's like, science, yeah. Yeah, here it's been a backlash against science and public health, very recent. And I'm, you know, I'm biased. I'm going, what, what is your problem? You know, this is, every day we get new information and then you can change what the rules are and that kind of thing. But it, get as much fact as you can. I don't watch uh, the news. I read I looked at the CDC website and now this new website I found, which is great because it's global and it's factual and it's accurate data. Um, oh, and I, I, I do look at the UN news because I like to follow Africa yeah. and what's happening yeah. now. So yeah, well, yeah, very, really like <laughs> yeah, well the, the backlash against science is very disappointing. Um, but I guess, uh, can, can I just finish? Can I just well, ask one final question, uh, Mona? Uh, and I, I guess, Based on your experience of looking at the, and I know the data is constantly developing, there's an awful lot we don't know about this virus, but I guess one thing that's very pressing at the moment um, is people are worried, will there be a second wave or even a third wave? And based on what, you, what we know about COVID-19, looking at the data as, we, as what we know at the moment, uh, do you think it will follow at that kind of trajectory, namely that countries lock down, get the figures down, but when they relax lockdown restrictions, uh, the virus will come back with a vengeance with a second wave. Do you think that's going to happen based, on your, based on, your, on your reading of the data? I would say yes. Okay. And it's based on discussion with uh, one of my closest friends, uh, just retired as a chair of epidemiology at University of Washington. And the same concerns because of summer holidays, then all this traveling, um, I would love to be wrong, so we could have a yeah, yeah, no. conversation. I hope I'm wrong, but uh, I do. I absolutely believe people should use common sense. I mean, really, it's not that difficult. Um, yeah. Follow the yeah. public health advice. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's probably not a bad way to end with a good oh, bit of public health advice and common sense as well. And, and pray. <laughs> and pray, yeah, because I think I think like you know, there's <laughs> there's only mo so many lockdowns a government can do. Like eventually, I think the right. solution has to be ourselves. You know, and we have husband... to start adapting our behavior to deal with the virus long term. And I suppose on that, now this is I'm I'm cheating. I'm asking another question. But Sweden are an outlier, Mona, and they're they're making the press a lot over here. A lot of people I are know, talking. I just read about you know the the, the yeah. Down. Yeah, but and and their approach is rather than having a lockdown release and then a lockdown again, they want softer measures over a longer period. Now it's it's causing a Absolutely. lot of controversy. Um, they have their fans, they have their detractors. But from your experience, what's your view on Sweden? Have they got it right or have they got it spectacularly wrong? So you love those A B, but you don't ask the C question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I it. Are you, well, it's, I, I know what you're saying. It's somewhere down the middle. Well, here's the thing. Yeah. Um, and we should have my husband here because, okay. you know, we could. Cool. He's a liar, though. <laughs> no, no, he's, oh, God, no. You know, but I remember one marital spat. He's like, I said, what's the matter? You know, he's like, you want to know what's the matter? You want to know what it's like being married to God? <laughs> this is the height of my epidemiology career, and you know, I was like really busy. Anyway, 
Um, that's, a, that's another thing, but um, what I did, I said in January, now it just was the intuitive epidemiology I meeting, I said, they should be doing these programs six months out. This whole thing of a month, and then we're gonna extend it a month, and then extend, it just screws people up. They don't know what to do. What they, and then when they change the rules a little bit, like yeah. people get messed up. I don't know, I think everyone should watch Sweden. But however, even though there's a lot of immigrant population, the Swedish are just healthy anyways, okay. and are very careful with their hygiene. And I mean, I've also been in Oslo and at WHO worked with some Scandinavians and Swedes. And so I, I hope I don't get any hate mail. That's a compliment, actually. No, saying. it's 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 right. And like you, ha you can't be too PC about these things. Like cultures have their own little idiosyncrasies and. And, and Scandinavians are uh, very disciplined. I think they, they will follow government advice. I think in countries like yours or mine, I think there can be more libertarian culture. People distrust the state, distrust the government. That can be a healthy thing in some ways, but I think for this, it's probably good that people are willing to follow the public health advice. And I think there's probably a high level of compliance in Sweden. But uh, Mona, look, I've kept you long enough. I've went way That's over good. time. I've asked uh, crazy binary questions uh, <laughs> where I should, <laughs> I should have had a, a, C, op a, a C option. Uh, and I apologize. That. But look, uh, as I said before, <laughs> I, 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 I immensely enjoyed your collection on the brink of the sea. And just for anyone watching, um, you can, I, I'll have an Amazon link in all the channels for Mona's book. All the proceeds of this book is well worth reading. It's, it's a very accomplished collection. And uh, all the proceeds go to Catholic Relief. We're doing great work in developing countries. And, um, and finally, uh, Professor Rachel Amona, uh, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. It's been, been a real, real pleasure. And um, I'd love to speak to you again about these fascinating topics and your fascinating work. And I want to say thank you so much. Uh, thank Anyone, you. Who, who's ever watching this, thank you, blessings, and be safe. So. Thank you. And likewise, okay. everyone watching at home, please feel free to give your comments, thoughts, observations. Thank you for your time. Be safe and uh, happy reading and keep the spirits up. Bye now. Bye. Bye-bye.